fruit of the Spirit. And if you remember from week number one, uh, we talked about love and joy. Do you remember what we talked about last week? Yes, we talked about peace. And today, hey, hold on one second. How's your patience? (laughs) Got it? That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about patience. Long suffering. You got to wait a little while. It's worth the wait. Uh, If I were to ask you this question, who is the most patient person that you know? My husband. The most patient person that you, hey, if you're married to a a patient person, that is a great thing. Uh, We need patient people in our lives and we need to learn to love difficult people. Do you know why? Because we are one. (laughs) And so patience is one of those things that I think everybody wants, but it's really hard to get. And sometimes we make the big mistake of praying for patience, as you'll find out in this sermon. And uh, and so patience is one of those difficult things that we, we try to work through. But there's good news. God may not change your circumstance or the people that is in your life, but God can change how you deal with people and how you deal with your circumstances through patience. And the Bible says in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is patience. And that means if God's Spirit resides inside of you, if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit will produce patience in your life if you will let him. And when I think about the most patient people in my life, um, you know, I do think about my family. They've put up with me for quite a long time. I think about my church family. Uh, I certainly am not the uh, easiest person to work with. I make a lot of mistakes and I fail often. Um, but, you know, I think about teachers. Teachers are the most patient people I think that I have ever met. I mean, they deal with kids from all different cultures, all different backgrounds, and they suffer through their weaknesses and their failures. And teachers, they got to put up with a lot. I mean, you guys got to admit, all the way from our early learning center that we have here, I think about my potter, my, my potter, that's my daughter Piper combined into one word. You know, I say a lot of elaborate things up here, okay? You just got to get used to it. Uh, if you've never been here before, it's an inside joke, I'm sorry. So anyways, you know, I think about teachers and they really have a lot of patience. They suffer for a long time, eight hours a day, and they do it over and over again. But they do it, why? Because they're patient people and they love what they do. You know, if you do want to marry somebody who's patient, here's what you should do, okay? Take them to the DMV. <laughs> As a date, say, hey, would you, would you mind going to the DMV with me? And then to really figure out what kind of person they are, don't tell them about this part. Take them to the post office afterwards to drop off or not drop off, buy a package and wait in line and see how they deal with difficult people. I mean, we live in a culture of instant gratification, Instant emails, instant satisfaction, instant food, instant text messages. If we don't get an email response or a text message response within 30 seconds, we're like, why is this person ignoring me? Is everything okay? We are so used to getting things right now. And when it comes to patience, there's only one road that you get to travel down in order to get biblical patience. And it's a very long road and it doesn't come very quickly. I want to talk to you and define what patience is. And there's really a lot to say about patience. Patience is an even temper that comes from a big heart. And that's what I think about with teachers, right? They have a big heart. They love kids. They want to see change in their lives. And so they're willing to put up with weaknesses and deficiencies and problems and evil. I mean, they're willing to put up with a ton of stuff. Because they are patient people. It comes from this combination of two words, macros and thymos. It means to have long anger. It means to avoid the premature use of force that rises up out of passion, like anger. So instead of being short-tempered, quick fuse, you are long-tempered. To be patient, then, is to have this internal and external control when you deal with difficult people. 
And how do you control yourself? Well, you delay your response. You choose loving tolerance in spite of people's weaknesses and failures. You know, the ancients had, a, had this understanding about patience. They literally believed this. It meant to hold it in your mind. Whatever was happening, the circumstance or the actions of the person, to hold it in your mind before you allowed it to come through your actions or your passions. We see this word used in ancient Greek literature. For instance, if you've ever heard about the Maccabean Revolt, they were a group of Jewish people who overthrew Greek tyranny. This guy named Antiochus Epiphanes came in and he destroyed the Jews, he destroyed the temple, he took a pig and he sacrificed it on the altar just to blaspheme Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. And so they, when they talked about the Roman world which overthrew the Greeks, the Romans eventually came in and took over and Literally, it says, they use this word patience, the Romans captured the world through two things, their policy and their patience. I mean, think about it yourself, right? The Romans would often endure the suffering of the people they were trying to conquer because they had a greater goal they wanted to accomplish. And if they were impatient people, and if they just went in and they killed people, right, obviously it would be harder to conquer the world. So they had policy. We want peace. We want control. We want to help you and your children and make your lives better. And we're going to be patient with you, even if you revolt against us. And so the Roman Empire would often respond with harshness and wrath, but it was always delayed. They always gave people a patient opportunity. So that's a little bit of background about the idea of patience. Patience is an act of love. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient. It is kind. It does not boast. Patience is not just something that we struggle through and whether or not we're going to get there. Patience is a divine act of love that we choose. Patience is love, and here's why. It does not succumb or surrender to the circumstance or the trial. You literally hold yourself up under the weight, and you patiently endure, and you wait. It is the opposite of anger. You know, when I think about my daughter Piper, uh, she's a little sweetheart, but man, she can get pretty fired up sometimes. And as children, right, they get pretty, for those of you who are parents and raise small children, you know that they can get really upset about something, especially when they don't understand. And Piper gets really upset when we try to play a movie for her and it doesn't happen just like that. She misunderstands. She thinks we might have turned off the TV or we're not going to play the DVD player for her. And so she'll select a movie and we'll put it in. And for those of us who are adults, we know, look, it's mechanical. Sometimes things go wrong, right? Sometimes the DVD gets frozen. Sometimes there's a delayed response because it's Blu-ray and now it has to upload and it takes a little bit of time. And she just will start getting upset. And I tell Piper, I, there's some key words and phrases that I try to tell her, you know, just wait a minute. Here it comes, and sometimes she'll repeat me, and everything's fine. But other times, she really misunderstands, and she throws a fit, and it actually, because she's impatient, it makes things worse. So if she's going to throw a fit, guess what? You're not going to get to watch the movie. And so we'll turn it off, and it only makes things worse. And when I think about patience, the main reason I think while we are impatient with people is because we don't understand we're lacking perspective. We don't see things from God's perspective. We see things from our perspective. And when we're impatient, we make things worse. We discipline ourselves. We cause ourselves to go through agony that isn't necessary because we lack perspective to the problems and the pain of other people around us. Like I said, when you look up this word patience, there's actually three different Greek words for patience that we translate patience in the English language, but they carried a different meaning to the Greeks. The first word for, I'm only going to talk to you about two, but the first word is hupomone. It literally means to endure the challenges of life. It means to um, have a temper which does not succumb under different circumstances in which you suffer. It means to be opposed to cowardly behavior. And so instead of interpreting and understanding this word as patience, it would be better to understand this word as perseverance. You don't get discouraged when bad things happen. Now, like I said, I'm a knucklehead and sometimes I do things that are really stupid. And so a lot of the times there are accidents, okay? Sometimes I do them on purpose because I like to irritate and agitate. That's part of my personality. I need to control that. But so we're putting in this stone patio. It's been four weeks, of course. Whenever I do a job, nine times out of ten, I suffer, okay? And so I get impatient. Sometimes I rush through and I get excited because I want to get the job done. Well, sure enough, Angel has a Jeep. 
I've got a Volkswagen, so I take Angel's Jeep because it's got a bigger trunk out to get some sand, and I load the trunk up. Okay, I put maximum capacity in there and I get to the house and I'm driving through the backyard and I'm all excited because I got my sand laying down these stone pavers and I'm driving and I'm not watching and all of a sudden I hear this loud noise and this jolt in the car. Well, I have a well and out of the well, you know, thankfully I hit the access pipe to the well. I didn't actually hit the well, so that's good news. So sure enough, I get out, and there's all this broken plastic on the ground, and I totally smash this uh, pipe in the back of my yard because I'm impatient, and I want to rush and get the job done, but I'm starting to sweat a little bit because <clears throat> it's not my vehicle. It's my wife's vehicle. It's the one that she drives. And so the first thing I do is I get out, and I look under the vehicle to see, hey, what's the damage? Thankfully, there was no damage. It hit metal, except for this one tube. And of course... It's the tube that allows gas to go from the insert to the gas tank. So I go to the store. They don't have any. Thankfully, Jeep had this really cool custom design that makes it almost impossible to find the part unless you buy the entire system. So that's really convenient. So I'm talking to the guy, and there's, you know, you got to buy like this $100 system. I'm like, I'm not doing that. There's got to be a better way. It's this nine-inch piece of plastic tubing. Well, the whole time, my wife has been awesome. Obviously, if it was your vehicle, how would you react, <laughs> right? You would be impatient, you'd be upset, you would not delay your wrath or your anger, but she says, look, honey, I forgive you, we'll figure this out, and I'm all upset, I'm more upset than what she is, but she is patient with me. Well, you know what? I just went to another store, and they gave me this nine-inch piece of tube for 20 bucks, and I put it on there and clamped it tight. Everything's okay. She was patient with me. She delayed her wrath. She delayed her anger. We overcame the difficult circumstance. Hupamone is dealing with a circumstance like that. It means to persevere and overcome a trial. It's the same word used in Romans chapter 5 where Paul says, We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces hupamone, perseverance. Courage, you don't get discouraged. And perseverance produces character and character hope. God permits us to go through suffering that we may develop an attitude of perseverance, that we may be courageous in difficult circumstances. That's hupomone. The other Greek word that's actually used in Galatians 5 is what angel dealt with and, and experienced and exuviated with me. And that was patience through long suffering. Long suffering deals with difficult people like myself. So when you're in a marriage, right, you've got hupomone patience through things, but you've got long suffering with people. And that's what we're going to talk about. Developing long suffering through dealing with difficult people. The Greek word is macro through muthai. It means long-suffering, self-restraint, which does not hastily retaliate or wrong. You are opposed to instant wrath or any revenge. It literally means this. You are able to endure obnoxious people. Now, I wrote a list of the most obnoxious people in my life, and I decided not to share it because I didn't want to offend some people in this room, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Isn't that bad? That is so, look, you're going to have to be long-suffering with me. Isn't that awful? But seriously, there have been some people in my life who are really, really obnoxious and loud and arrogant. And you're like, man, I really can't stand this person. But if we are going to be long-suffering, we got to put up with obnoxious people. And maybe I'm that for you. Instead of overcoming the storm, like Hupamone, right, you've persevered, you've conquered the challenge, you've solved it, you bought the $20 piece of tubing to repair your vehicle. Instead of overcoming the difficult circumstance and the storm, you sit down and you patiently endure it, right? You sit down in the midst of the storm and you let the thunder and the lightning and the earthquake and the tornado happen and you wait it out. That's what long suffering literally means. It's having the power to calm the storm. Yeah, you're a Roman army. You could totally destroy this nation, but instead, you don't. You couldn't respond in wrath and anger, but instead, you don't. You know, the Bible says when Jesus hung on the cross, it says he could have summoned 12 legions of angels. But what did he do? He patiently endured 
the evil of other people. He didn't. He didn't respond. He had the ability, but he chose not to. Another idea that I think about with this idea of patiently enduring, we are in a culture of social media justice. If you don't like a restaurant, what do you do? You blast it on Facebook or you give them a poor, poor review. If you don't like an institution or a business, you go online and you give it one star. And rather than patiently enduring obnoxious people, you get online and you just give all your wrath out at once. People do it with churches. You know, China is actually allowing people to rate other people. If you look at your phone and you're with somebody that's close to you, it actually will pop up on the GPS screen. It will show you their credit score. And now they're even getting to the point where you can actually rate individuals. How would you like to be rated between one and five stars online? You want to tell me that's not going to be a mess? I mean, is that really the kind of world we want to live in with the kind of impatient people that we experience in our own life and how we are so quick to respond with wrath and indignation? I mean, it is happening, people, and it is going to be a recipe for disaster. I would rather choose long-suffering and patience than to get into that kind of mess. And here's the simple reality. The outcome of God's Spirit living in you is you do not react with wrath or anger when you deal with difficult people. Instead, you oppose revenge. Okay, so now we know what patience is. It's long-suffering. Why do I need to have it? What's the big deal? I've lived my life this long. Why should I be a patient person? My life has worked for me thus far. And here's the first reason. Number one, the Holy Spirit is in your life to make you holy. It's to make you like God. And so if we are a Christian and we are committed to being the person that God has called us to be, we will develop the attitude of being long-suffering, of being patient. Patience aligns you with God himself. And so if you want to be in a relationship with God, you got to become like him, and that's being patient. Secondly, it is wise to be patient. Proverbs 19, 11 says this, A man's insight gives him patience, and his virtue is to overlook an offense. If you want to have skillful living, you'll develop the attitude and the idea of being a patient person. It's not only making you holy, but it's giving you the ability to exercise skillful living. This is wisdom at its finest. Patience is a virtue because we don't make a big deal out of small things. We see things from a certain perspective. I would contend that having this kind of patience is the ability to see things from God's perspective. So instead of saying, how do I see this person? And how do I respond to this person? Here's what we should ask. What does God think about this person? How is God viewing this circumstance? What would God have me do in this circumstance and situation and dealing with this difficult individual? Would he act out in love, which is what we talked about in week one, which means to make a decision in the best interest of the other person? Would God be joyful? Would he point the person and shift them to the good things that we should celebrate? Or would he harp and look at the bad things and the negativity and the evil things? In other words, would God be quick to forgive and point to future hope? Or would he say, look, you're worthless and I don't like you, get away from me. Would God be a peacemaker? Would he be interested in saying things that would lead to ultimate peace? Or would God want division and chaos with this person? What would God's perspective be on this individual? And how would God deal with them? And then that gives us the ability to be wise and see things from God's perspective. Why should we be patient? It helps us be holy. It helps us be wise. Let me give you a few reasons why it helps us be wise. First of all, a patient person is a peacemaker because they calm arguments. You show me a person that argues with people constantly, I'll show you a person who is totally impatient. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 18 says, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger calms a dispute. You delay your wrath. You're a wise person. If you're interested in making peace, a patient person is a king pleaser because you're acting through self-control and knowledge rather than emotion and selfishness. If you want to be able to persuade the king, in other words, if you want to influence people, if you want to have an impact on the people around you, you'll be patient. If you don't really care about your relationships, if you're on a, a hell-bent path of destruction and you don't care what kind of relationships you ruin in the process, be impatient. Wise people will be patient, and patient people will preserve relationships. Look what the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 32. He who is slow to anger is better than a warrior. Well, I'm strong. I've got a lot of accomplishments. I've got a chiseled body. I have finally made it. I'm a warrior who can fight. But you're not as good as a patient person. You're not as strong as a patient person. 
And he who controls his temper is greater than one who captures a city. I mean, think about that. This would be like starting a business and selling it for $60 million. This would be like finally getting the body of your dreams. This would be like finally marrying the person of your dreams. You have reached the greatest goal that you could set for yourself. And it is better for you to be patient than one who finally accomplishes all of your goals. You know, being impatient, it's like putting duct tape on an earthquake. It's like going out when you see a tornado and trying to fight it. It just doesn't work. You're only going to make things worse. That's why patience is so important. When we live impatiently, we only make our situation worse for ourselves. And you know, lack of patience, it causes unstable relationships, broken marriages, lack of social connection, and even psychological disorders. You show me an impatient person, and I will show you somebody who is really mentally unhealthy. To be patient is to wait long before indulging your passions. And you know, we talk a little bit, a lot about anger when we talk about the idea of patience. But patience simply means to delay your your response to your passion. This could involve sex. I mean, you want to talk about a society of instant gratification. If you are an impatient person, your relationships with the opposite sex, if you're not married, will be primarily motivated by your instant gratification. And you build a relationship just off of physical pleasures, and you are going to be in a world of hurt. Think about money. I mean, imagine not being patient with your money. You know, you can actually get a better return on your investment if you buy and hold rather than trying to day trade stocks. And people do that for a full-time living, and they're really good at it. But most of us aren't. And if you look at the longevity of your retirement portfolio, if you buy and hold rather than trying to guess the bottom and get the top, which takes a lot of good practice and patience itself, but you are better off financially if you're just patient and you just wait. How many of us have rushed into a job and we have found out this is not good and I have made a big mistake, right? Rather than being patient. We do stuff like this all the time. This is why patience is so important. Now, where does patience come from, right? We got a little bit of information about what it is and why it's important. Well, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is patience. And if you want godly patience, you got to have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. But once you get God's Spirit inside of you, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is you can be a more patient person. The bad news is it's going to take a lot of difficult people in order to get there. There are three ways that you get patience. Here's the first way. You deal with evil people. Evil people, not difficult people. I'm talking about flat out evil people. When Peter talked about evil people in, in 2 Peter, or excuse me, yeah, 2 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, he talks about you know, the salvation process and how God has rescued us and redeemed us through his sacrifice. And he gives us this example. God patiently waited in the days of Noah while Noah built the ark. And Noah built the ark for 100 years. God waited and suffered long with evil people. Noah waited and suffered long with evil people. And if we are going to develop patience in our life, we are going to come into contact with people who are evil and who do evil things. Not just offensive things, but we're talking about dark, evil things. You know, when the apostle Paul He was writing to Timothy. Here's what he had to say. He says, Timothy, you have observed my teaching and my conduct and my purpose and my faith and my long suffering, my patience, my love and my endurance. You have seen and heard about my persecutions and the sufferings that have come upon me. But look at what he says in verse 12. He says, indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Persecution is when people hate you for your faith, when they bring down punishment, evilness upon you because of your faith. And if you don't think that you're going to suffer, you've got a rude awakening ahead of you because people are evil and they hate Christianity. You know, you look online, for instance, or you read the news, you really don't hear a lot about Islam. You don't hear a lot about Buddhism or Hinduism. What's the main thing that's often attacked? It's Christianity. Christianity. People despise Christianity. They don't pick mainly on any other religion other than Jesus. When people take the Lord's name in vain, they don't say Allah's name. They don't say a Hindu God's name. They say Jesus Christ in a blasphemous way. Why is that? 
Because it's promised. Persecution persecution is promised. And look what Paul says in verse 13. He says, you will be persecuted while evil men and imposters go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, I had read an article um, about last month. There's an attorney that's been appointed by our attorney, um, General uh, Barr, Attorney General Barr. And this guy, when I first saw his picture, you could immediately tell he was from Texas. I mean, instantly. You guys may know who I'm talking about. His name is John Durham. And John was the main uh, attorney, the representative of the United States, who was able to expose corruption at the Boston office of the FBI. And what John was able to expose is that there was actually a cover-up. Four men were imprisoned wrongfully for 30-plus years for a crime they never committed, and the FBI and the Boston office covered it up. And this guy exposed them. I mean, you want to talk about somebody that will put the fear of God in you if you're an evil man? This guy is it. And so I'm reading this story about these four guys who were falsely imprisoned by the FBI. And look, I've got great respect for our law enforcement, for people who are in government positions, who uphold justice. Romans 13 is very clear. God appoints authority to exercise his judgment on this earth. And so I am thankful for the 99% who do what is right. But this guy was able to expose the 1% who were evil and corrupt. And so they sentenced these four men to prison for 30 plus years for a murder they never committed. In fact, one of the men was in Florida at the time of the murder and they covered up and hid information from the court in order for their person they were trying to protect, he was a person of interest they were trying to protect, they allowed these men to suffer 30 years in prison and the guy who lived in Florida even died in prison. Can you imagine, I mean, think about that for a second. Can you imagine being prosecuted for a crime you never committed, dying in prison after being there for 35 years and not have your heart turned hard towards evil people? Well, thankfully, John exposed this lie. Um, He exposed this cover-up by the FBI and the Boston office. He brought these guys to justice. These gentlemen were awarded $102 million for being falsely accused. And I'm not saying these guys are great or that they were perfect or that they weren't bad people at all. But man, you look at a guy who's a World War II veteran living in Florida, not even in that place at the time of the murder, and yet sentenced to die in prison. Well, look, we suffer things from people who are evil all the time. And while there are a lot of good people, there are certainly a lot of evil people. And if you want to be patient, you have to suffer. And that's the bad news. The good news is, is you can become more patient. And so we look at this idea simply this. Patience is to endure evil. Just like this man endured for 35 years in prison and unfortunately he lost his life. But he was patient. He was long-suffering. And three of them got out of prison, and they were rewarded this retribution. Number two, patience is dealing with painful people. Not just people who are evil, but we know a lot of people like this, don't we? I mean, it's just like, oh, good, here comes so-and-so. You know who I'm talking about. Maybe it happens at church. Maybe it's at your job. You see him coming down the hallway. What do you do? You turn the other way. Why? Because they're obnoxious. You don't like them. You don't want to be around them. Have you ever been injured by someone, and you've refrained from responding to them? I was at the CVS drive through the other day. Walked up to get a prescription. Uh, I didn't walk, I drove up. I was at the window, and I gave two names. My wife and my son, Knox. And she said, okay, you know, she went through, you know, got angels. And I said, well, did you get Knox? She goes, I can only do one person at a time. And I, I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty angry. And I really wanted to respond, like, you know, with harshness and snap back at her. But I was like, man, I gotta preach on patience this week. <laughs> And who knows what kind of day she was having. I didn't have good perspective. I was only living in the moment. And sometimes we have to deal with people who are painful. The Santa Claus is my all-time favorite movie, okay? Not ashamed of it. 90s had the best movies. And if you don't agree with me, you know, you can be wrong. Uh, But anyways, so the Santa Claus in the 90s, you know, was like the best movie. As a kid, it brought me a lot of comfort. I'd play it every night before I went to bed. And uh, in one of the parts, you know, he actually becomes Santa Claus. So he puts on the suit, climbs up the roof, and he takes on the person of Santa Claus. Well, the head elf Bernard is trying to explain to the new Santa Claus that you are now Santa Santa Claus. You took the card, you put on the suit, you became the big guy. And so he's trying to explain this to him. And Scott is just not getting it. 
okay? He is not getting it at all. He's saying, I don't understand this. I don't want to be Santa Claus. And Bernard responds to this, try to understand this. And everybody gets really quiet. And that's us, isn't it? I mean, when you're trying to teach somebody something and you've taught it to them 60 times and they still don't get it, who does not get frustrated, okay? You're probably a teacher if you don't get frustrated, right? You probably are, a full-time teacher, it's your job. But we develop this attitude, why can't you just get it? Parents, can I get an amen? I had no idea you'd have to actually repeat things to your child in order to get them to learn. So I can't I like have them watch a video or something like that? You know what I mean? Drop them off somewhere and they learn stuff and I don't have to be a parent. I mean, that's kind of what you go into thinking of it, right? No. Man, I have to teach my kids the same thing over and over and over again. Knox fell off the chair this morning. Broke my heart. Been trying to get him not to climb on the chair, but he just doesn't get it. And he doesn't want to learn. And so I have to walk over. And finally, we just gave in. We took almost all of our chairs downstairs and we put the chairs on top of the table. It's a war we're just not going to fight anymore. <laughs> you win, we lose. <laughs> Knox is like, I can wait. You know what I mean? But the little rascal, man, I'm telling you, every single day of my life, morning and evening with the kids, climbs the chairs, opens the cabinet, grabs things he shouldn't have. And it's like, I'm about to lose my mind. <laughs> If you aren't a parent, it's the best thing that will ever happen to you, okay? <laughs> Anyways, you know, when the Bible talks about putting up with painful people, the Bible never uses hupomone to refer to God, dealing with difficult circumstances. You know why? God doesn't need to refine his character. There is no circumstance that is too difficult for God, but long-suffering is used of God. Do you know why? Because we're difficult people, aren't we? We're difficult people. And so if we are going to be patient, we must deal with people who are evil, and we must deal with people who are painful. And the nation of Israel was literally a thorn in the flesh of God. He loved them. They were his chosen nation to bring about his will. But man, those people were stubborn and ignorant. And not just like ignorant of byproducts. They knew the truth, and they chose not to do it, especially when it came to Jesus. They saw his miracles, they saw his wonders, and they chose to reject God anyways. And the Bible says in Romans 2, 4, this is what Paul had to say. By the way, Paul was somebody who experienced the patience of God. Paul says, do you disregard the riches of his kindness and, the, and God's tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance? Here's what the Jews thought. Well, everybody else isn't allowed to do it, but we are. Everybody else isn't allowed to steal, but we are. And here's the mistake that they made. Because God hasn't punished us yet, it must mean we're okay. That, that was their idea. God says, how often do I have to explain this to you? I've sent you prophet after prophet to tell you the truth, and you are just not getting it. No, 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 no. My patience isn't approval of what you do. My patience is because I love you, and I want you to be saved. But time and time again, they just didn't get it. The nation of Israel did not get it. And look what Paul literally calls them from God's perspective in Romans 9, 22. He says, with great patience right? With great patience, Israel were vessels of God's wrath fit for destruction. God says, look, I know you're going to continue to do the stupid thing, but I'm going to give you time, and I'm going to wait, and I'm going to deal with people who are simply painful people to deal with. Now, we're talking about the nation of Israel as a whole here, okay? That's the example that God has set for us, and here's the deal. If we are going to be patient, we've got to deal with people the way God deals with people, and he waits, We've got to be slow in avenging our injuries. You know, you look at the Old Testament and you see guys like David. David was being persecuted by Saul, and unrightfully so. And he actually had the ability to kill Saul in a cave while he was sleeping. And guess what David did? He was patient. He didn't exercise his wrath and his vengeance. I told you about Angel. She could have come out and just raked me up and down for being impatient and not watching what I was doing. And rightfully so. I mean, I deserved it. I broke her vehicle after all, right? She was patient. She delayed her anger. I read a quote this week. It was really good. It says this, when you temper your anger, you do not immediately avenge the wrong, but you leave opportunity for repenting to the one who has transgressed. It would have been a little bit different if I would have been arrogant and ignorant about my mistake. Oh, what's this stupid pipe doing here? <laughs> you know what I mean? When you stub your toe, you're like, what? Who put that there? Stupid thing. Because we're impatient people and we can be arrogant and proud. But here's the deal. 
You delay your wrath and you give people a chance. That's what it means to be patient. And man, we've got to do that with painful people. And then a third way that you get patience from God's Holy Spirit is you are patient in dealing with your expectations. And sometimes dealing with difficult people is not easy. And sometimes, frankly, we just want it to end. Have you ever felt like that? God, why can't you just come back and just do away with all this stuff? Why do I have to deal with this person every single day? God, why can't you just make things right finally? Just let it happen. It doesn't work that way. God wants us to be patient with our difficult circumstances. And so we have certain expectations. And God wants us to be patient. And then we'll end with this idea. What do we need to do as a patient Christian? Here are three things I want you to leave with today. Now that you know what patience is, you know what the kind of people you need to be patient with, and that patience only comes through dealing with difficult people, three easy things that you can do as a patient Christian. Number one, yield to the Spirit. Whenever you've got a difficult person, I guarantee there are two things that are going on in your mind. I can't stand this person and I want to lash out, but I shouldn't. Two things. Your emotion and your conviction. The Holy Spirit's telling you to do one thing. Your emotions are desperately wanting to do another. And here's where it comes. You come to a fork in the road with a difficult person, and you've got to choose which way you're going to go. Are you going to yield and turn left to the Holy Spirit? Are you going to give in to yourself and your emotions and turn right? How do you deal with difficult people? Yield to the Holy Spirit. It means to surrender. You know, we had this game. Maybe you played it as a, as a student. Students do really stupid things sometimes. We had this game called Mercy. You'd lock hands. Anybody play this game? And you would impose your will on the other person. And so you take those fingers. People I would not play with are like Tony Karastavich, okay? He sits over here. He's got sausage fingers from using his hands with tools. I mean, this guy, it's like vice grips. If he were to get a hold of you, not going anywhere, okay? So I'd never play with somebody like Tony. But man, we were kids and we would try to bend each other's fingers. And finally, if you imposed your will enough, the other person would cry out, mercy, mercy, ow, stop, mercy. Yield to the Spirit. There's a war that goes on against your flesh. If I'm busy doing spiritual things, I won't be doing sinful things. At the end of this series, you guys are going to get that, all right? Audience participation. So if you want to be a patient Christian, yield to the Holy Spirit in your life. The Spirit is influencing you to do godly things and not worldly things. Number two, fast. Give up some food. Give up some things that you enjoy for a while. The Bible says when you fast, you will see the face of God. And if you are struggling with impatience, give these things up to draw near to God through prayer. And some of you might be scratching your head. You're like, dude, impatience is the problem. I don't want to make it worse by being hangry. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, if you are married to somebody who emotional state is driven off of food, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're like, sometimes, you know, I'm like, have you eaten yet? Like, no, I haven't eaten all day. Well, let's get you some food. All better. <laughs> all better. Happens with Piper, happens with Knox. Sometimes it happens with me. Okay, I'll be honest. You know how I know we're doomed when it comes to patience? Food. It's food. You know how I know that? Our restaurants. Think about this. We go to a restaurant, and if the wait is too long, we're like, I'm not waiting 30 minutes to get something to eat. I'm going somewhere where I can get it quick. And then when we actually get into the restaurant, we have a pre-meal prep session called appetizers while we wait on our food. We are doomed. <laughs> Think about that. Hey, can I get something to eat while I wait to eat? <laughs> It is ridiculous. We do this. Chips and salsa are my favorite things. How many times have I eaten chips and salsa and I'm full by the time my meal gets there? Fast. Give these things up. If you are frustrated in a restaurant, you probably are not a patient person, okay? Fast. Give these things up. Draw near to the face of God. He is long-suffering with obnoxious, difficult people. And if you fast, you will draw near and you will be more patient. And then thirdly, include the Holy Spirit. Don't exclude the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we can extinguish the Spirit in 1 Thessalonians. It says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. Our relationship with God is personal. He indwells our heart and our mind and our life. And we can actually make him sad, grieve him. We can put the fire out of God, live in our lives. You want to ruin your Christianity? Don't live holy life. Don't live a holy life. 
The way that we put out the fire of God in our life is when we choose sinful things over spiritual things, and then we just don't feel like going anymore. Have you ever reached a point like that? You skip one Sunday, and then two, and then three, and next thing you know, you haven't been to church for a year. Or you give in to one temptation, and next thing you go on a binge, whether it's overeating, like we talked about last week, sexual indulgence that we talked about last week. You get angry, you finally have let yourself go, and it feels good, and you have that epinephrine release in your brain, and you finally have been able to be angry, and then your short fuse comes back. If you give an inch on your sinful flesh, it wants to take a mile And when we resist God's spirit in our heart and in our mind, we grieve him and suppress him and push him away. Here's what we tell the Holy Spirit when we reject him. You're not wanted here. And when you push the Holy Spirit out, he leaves. He gets suppressed. He gets seared. He goes away. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Fast from physical fleshly things and include the Holy Spirit. Don't exclude the Holy Spirit. And man, I love this. I've saved the best scripture for last. You guys have been patient through this sermon, by the way. You know, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, a lot of us know his name. If you don't know Paul, Saul of Tarsus was his former name, and he persecuted the church. When Christianity came on the scene, he oversaw Christians being thrown in jail. He oversaw Christians being stoned to death. Okay? You want to talk about God being patient with a person. The Apostle Paul was somebody who received long-suffering from God, And the Apostle Paul was not a very patient man. Well, when God intervened in his life, and like I said, a lot of you know this story, when God intervened in his life, Paul was very patient. And about 30 years after Paul became a Christian, he looked back and he reflected on his life. And this is what he had to say. This is a trustworthy saying, worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for this very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. You know, sometimes I ask, man, how can God put up with a person like me? How can God forgive me over and over again? I mess up, I make mistakes, I sin, I tell God, I'm not going to do that anymore, or think that anymore, and I turn right around the next day, and I do it. You guys ever done something like that before? But we serve a God who is long-suffering. He's willing to put up with us, and be patient with us, and suffer through relationships with us, because we're worth it. And so Peter simply said this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some understand slowness, But he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. In other words, God looks at you and says, you are worth the wait. When other people run out on you because they've had enough, I won't. When other people get frustrated with you because you continue to disappoint them, I won't. Why? Because I want a relationship with you. And you know, even though my kids drive me nuts sometimes, I waited seven years to have kids and I wouldn't change it for the world. That little girl, Piper, was worth the wait. And she'll always be worth the wait. Because I love her. And I'm her father. And I wouldn't change a relationship with her for anything. And that's exactly how God feels about you. Don't believe the lie that God's ready to toss you out because he just can't put up with you anymore. Oh, no. God demonstrated his love for you in this, and that while you were the worst sinner, he died for you. Be patient as God is patient with you. (laughs) Suffer through obnoxious people as God suffers sometimes through a relationship with you, and you will be the person that God wants you to be. Let's stand and let's pray.